Thank you very kindly, Eddie, for the introduction, and let me say to each one of you tonight that I'm delighted to be here with you again. It's been a couple of years since I was on the lecture program here, but it is a real pleasure to be back in this part of the state of Texas and to see so many folks that I've known fondly in years gone by. May I suggest this evening in the presentation of this material that you do not try to follow along in the book because there is much more material in the manuscript than I could possibly deal with in the next 30 or 35 minutes. And so I'm simply going to sort of uh, summarize some of the basic points of the material, to present it in a little more popular way than is in the written form, and I trust that you'll just sit back and relax and not be cumbered by trying to follow along in that printed material. I believe that it was Charles Dickens in the beginning of his book, A Tale of Two Cities, who started out that narrative in this way. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. That is an expression that might well apply to the age in which we live. For certainly we are heir to some of the most wonderful things that the mind of man has ever conceived. We've been to the moon. You can buy a digital watch for $3.95. They're performing surgery with a laser beam. Oh, the marvelous things that we're privileged to see in this 20th century. But at the very same time, there appear to be clouds upon the horizon that portend dark days ahead. Fantastic things of drastic proportions that absolutely defy human description and certainly go beyond the imagination of any of our ancestors and indeed we ourselves just a few decades ago. We're living in an age of science. Someone not long ago suggested that there has been more new, raw, accumulated human knowledge in the last 50 years, more, I say, in the last half century than in all the history of the world previous. Now, the thing about it is, at the same time as we are accelerated in our technological and scientific knowledge, we are also gradually drifting away from a recognition that God is in control of the universe and that the laws by which uh, our universe operates are subject to Him and that we too as free moral creatures are subject to not only the natural laws of the universe but the ethical and spiritual and moral laws that God has bequeathed to us through the objective revelation of the Bible. Man is increasingly ambitious to be his own God. George Gaylord Simpson, formerly of Harvard University, who was so popular in his teaching of the theory of evolution, for a number of decades in this country, concluded one of his popular books by saying that man can and he must manage and decide his own destiny. In other words, cut loose from this antiquated, legendary notion that a God exists somewhere. You are God. You make the rules, and you, therefore, will be directed by the standard which you project. 
William Henley in his infamous poem, Invictus, said these familiar lines, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Well, we have a unique situation developing. As man expands in his knowledge and as he recedes from a recognition of his responsibility to the God of heaven, it becomes rapidly apparent that we're on a sort of a collision course. That is, we have all sorts of new toys and technology, but how shall they be employed? If there is no God, there is no moral standard. Now, you just remember that as probably the most important thing I'll say tonight. If there is no God, if there is no ultimate, absolute standard of right and wrong, then, as Jean-Paul Sartre, the French existentialist, said it, anything goes. There are no rules. Do your own thing is the name of the game. So a lot of us are concerned. A lot of people in scientific endeavors are very concerned as to where the human race is going. There are some real bizarre speculations on the scientific horizon. Let me introduce for your consideration tonight several things that a number of scientists are prophesying and projecting that they feel confident or at least they fantasize may well occur within the next few decades. First of all, some scientists have said that probably within the next decade or so, we will be cloning human beings. Now, I don't believe that. But nonetheless, that's what they're suggesting. Cloning, of course, has been practiced for a long time. So far as plants are concerned, it's already being to be, beginning to be practiced in certain lower forms of animal life. I'll talk about that a little more later on this evening, if I have the time to do it. But let me simply suggest that cloning is the reproduction, the identical reproduction of an organism without the necessary or the preliminary sexual process being involved. Ideally, what they could do is take some of your body cells, any of your body cells, and from the genetic information in the nucleus of that cell, they could reproduce identically another you. Now, I suggest that even to talk in terms of something of that nature is an extremely dangerous situation. Already certain forms of new biological life are being patented and sold. A new bacterium has been developed that will eat oil. And so they're developing this so that when a tanker out on the sea or in the bay somewhere has a huge oil spill, they will unleash this bacteria and it will devour the oil. But the problem that some scientists are raising is this. What if its appetite is not satisfied? There may be a movie coming out, The Blob That Ate Houston. So they don't know where these things are going. They just unleash certain forces and have no idea what the final result might be. Some scientists are suggesting, sort of a la Hitlerism, that only certain human beings with superior genotypes be allowed to reproduce. In other words, if a young couple got married or they reached uh, sexual maturity, they would have to be tested and registered. And if they did not meet the state or the national government's standards, they would be sterilized and only the superior individuals would be allowed 
to reproduce. Some scientists and some professors in some universities are actually advocating this. And I have documentation that uh, demonstrates exactly what they're saying along these lines. Some are suggesting that natural reproduction as we now know it will in the future become a thing that's entirely obsolete. Now, they don't mean by that that sex will be outlawed. It will still be a recreational sport. But what they mean is this. The actual reproduction of children will be more or less artificially done. Now, here's what would happen. Let's say a young couple gets married, and the first thing they will do is go down to the reproduction bank. She will donate some eggs from her ovaries. He will donate some sperm from his body, and these organisms will be frozen. He'll go about pursuing his career. She'll go about pursuing hers. Two or three years down the line, they will decide that they would like to have a child. So they'll call up the reproduction bank. Hello? This is Mr. Jones. My wife and I would like to order a baby for next November. Oh, I think about the 15th would be okay. And so you put in the order. At the proper time, they will thaw out the sperm, thaw out the egg, perform the in vitro fertilization that is in the glass, in the dish, in the test tube. They are now working on a stainless steel and glass womb which they hope that that tiny fertilized egg could be placed in and brought to its entire term. So that come next November the 15th, you would get a phone call, Mr. Jones, would it be all right if we delivered your baby this afternoon at 3 o'clock? All right. And put it on master charge if you would. <laughs> and so a child comes into the world via that mechanical, technical, impersonal process. Now they're talking seriously about things of that nature. Did you know that genetic experimentation with rats has been able to increase the size of a rat's brain by 76% with a corresponding increase in learning capacity? Scientists are now talking, since rats are mammals, about the possibility, therefore, of genetically manipulating human beings and doubling the size of the human brain. Now, I know some of you are thinking about some of the brethren that you think might be able to profit from that. <laughs> but I would remind you that uh, quantity is not always to be equated with quality. But that's a very dangerous individual, and it smacks of the idea of playing God. I want to talk about a little bit later on the fact that God designed us in a perfect and a wonderful way and we don't have the right to go into the blueprints of the human mechanism and redesign ourselves. That's going beyond the bounds of propriety. Some scientists are talking about altering the human digestive system so that we would be able to eat cellulose or hay like cows. And therefore, perhaps that would be one of the solutions to the uh, food problem in the world. Again, they are tampering with something that uh, is beyond their ability to control. One scientist has even suggested the possibility of genetically crossing human beings with plants so that our skin could perform photosynthesis that is, making food as a consequence of sunlight. Crossing us with plants. Do you want your daughter to marry a geranium? <laughs> that would really be ludicrous. It would be all in wonderfully good humor if it were not serious, brethren. 
They're talking about serious things, and they're talking about things that they are doing in the laboratory or attempting to do. Now, how do we determine which of these things is right and which are wrong? There are so many things that the Bible does not specifically address. Someone says, Brother Jackson, give me a passage that speaks about blood transfusions. There is none specifically. Where is the passage that addresses inoculations? Or the passage that speaks concerning genetic engineering? Or surrogate parenthood? Or cloning? Or a number of these other things that we've mentioned or could mention. The Bible does not specifically address these issues. It was not designed to address address every specific problem in explicit language. Oh, the Word of God would have to be immeasurably large across the centuries to accommodate everything of that nature. But you can be assured that the Bible does, in one way or another, address every single problem that the human family faces. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of God abides forever. Well, how then, Brother Wayne, does it address these issues? By the principles which it contains. Don't expect to look for explicit answers to these problems spelled out in every jot and tittle sense. But the Bible contains principles that will be applicable to these situations in any age. And thus man will never outgrow his need for the Word of God. Now tonight let me talk about two or three of these principles that would help us immeasurably in addressing a whole host of these issues that we've introduced already. The first principle I want to talk about is the principle of the sanctity and the uniqueness of human life. The Bible teaches that Jehovah God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Genesis 2-7. Not only are we creatures of biological life, and actually Genesis 2-7 involves more than that, Not only are we creatures of biological life, but we are creatures made in the very image of God. Genesis 1, 26, Behold, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And that, of course, is not in the physical image of God because God is not physical. John 4, 24, He is spirit. But nonetheless, we are in His image, and that sets us apart from the rest of the biological world. We are not plants. We are not animals. We are human beings designed and created in the image of Almighty God. And the life we possess is a gift from God. When Paul addressed the great philosophers on Mars Hill in Athens, he said in Acts 17, 25, it is God who giveth to all life and breath and all things. So I submitted to you tonight that life is a gift from God to be treasured, to be reverenced, and to be responsibly dealt with. Human life these days is a rather cheap commodity. This obviously is because that so many of the masses have been brainwashed with the idea that after all, we are but higher evolved organisms. We share a common birthright with plants and animals. And the only difference between we and they is the fact that we have simply evolved a higher thinking capacity. Basically, we're all just on the same plane. 
Well, let me address some of the issues that relate to this biblical principle. I could not uh, speak of this particular principle without briefly commenting upon the phenomenon of abortion in our country today, in the world today. The United Nations estimates that there are 55 million abortions performed around the world every year. Who knows how many actually. The estimate is obviously low. In this country, since the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision of 1973, we have been slaughtering somewhere between the neighborhood of two to three million unborn infants every year. Here is a real sobering fact. We kill more babies in any one year in this country than we have lost in all of the 200 years of wars that this nation has been involved in. In one year we kill more. Adolf Hitler in all his infamy never did to the Jews what we do to our unborn every year. The Bible teaches the sanctity of the human being from the time of conception onward. In Psalm 51, David said, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That passage is not talking about hereditary total depravity. I'm not addressing that right now, but I'm simply pointing out that David considered himself to be an M, E, a me, a personality from the time of his conception. God told the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1, 5, I knew you before I formed you in the womb. Yes, he did. And I want you to think about this. In James chapter 2 and verse 26, James says in defining death, that the body apart from the spirit is dead. What is a dead body? A dead body is a body from whence the spirit has departed. Well, to reverse the statement, what is a live body? A body wherein the spirit resides. Anytime, therefore, you have a living body, according to the biblical definition of James 2.26, you have a spirit there. Now, from the time of conception, though it is microscopic, you have a tiny living body. Logical deduction forces one to the conclusion that the spirit is imparted at that time, and therefore to presumptuously and deliberately destroy it from that time onward is to be guilty of murder. Shakespeare said a rose by any other name would smell as sweet and murder by any other name is just as heinous. And so we've got the problem of abortion. Then not altogether divorced from that is the relatively new concept of in vitro fertilization. Do you remember little Lucy Brown? I believe her name was. Over in England... Dr. Steptoe and his compatriot fertilized a woman's egg in a test tube with her husband's sperm. The fertilized egg was then implanted back into Mrs. Jones or whatever her name was. And nine months later, this beautiful little baby blonde-headed girl was delivered. The entire world stood in awe, and so did I. What an amazing thing. The thing about it is, uh, a lot of people are not aware of the fact that when that experiment was performed, and as it has been subsequently performed, 
a number of eggs are taken from the woman and fertilized, and only one or so is selected to bring to term, and all the others are destroyed. And so many murders are committed at the expense of bringing this new life into existence. And that's wrong. That makes the process wrong, at least in its present stage. Did you know that some scientists are even suggesting that we might implement this process, fertilize in the dish many, many eggs, and use these tiny little organisms to experiment with? Give them cancer, for example, and let's see how it works upon them and maybe we can come up with a cure. Because you see, it's very easy to argue in that vein if you deny the personality of those little bitty people. I tell you, it's a horrendous thing. The sanctity of human life. Then there is the ever-growing problem of euthanasia which is a euphemism. It literally means the good death. And it's being applied in a number of ways. For example, Dr. Francis Crick, who was the co-discoverer of DNA, which is the biological substance of life, has suggested that when a child is born, it should not be certified as human for a certain period of time until we determine whether or not it's normal. And then if we should discover, for example, that it's a mongoloid or it has other, some other serious deficiency, since we have not yet put the stamp on it and certified it as 100% grade A human, then it would be all right to go ahead and kill it. One doctor has written, and I've got these quotes in the book documented from the original sources, one doctor has written that there are at least 2,000 children per year in our hospitals across America that are allowed to die, allowed to starve to death, if you will, simply because they are deficient in some way or another. Well, it's but a short step further from that to suggest that uh, some of our older people who are getting incapacitated may have to be removed from the scene. Joseph Fletcher, the famous proponent of situation ethics, has made the observation that some of the older incapacitated people of our society have the obligation to die Get out of the way. And if you don't think this is coming, let me suggest this for your consideration. We are rapidly moving towards an elderly society because we're killing off millions of the unborn. We've got better medical technology than we've ever had. People are living longer. So we're getting a huge segment of our society that are older and a lesser number that are reaching the younger years, the real productive years. Now, how in the world will the younger folks, several decades from now, be able to support all of these old people? It's going to be a tremendous strain on the economy, and I'll tell you, money talks. And so the suggestion is being made, well... There's going to have to be a point where some of them will just have to be eliminated. And there will be no moral obstacle to that in the minds of a lot of people. What's being violated? The sanctity of human life. Let's remember that, brethren. It's a very, very vital biblical principle. In the second place, there's another principle that I'd like to talk about for a couple of moments. And I simply call it the principle of the dignity of man. And it relates to a premise that I introduced earlier, namely this, that man is a creature of God. He has been designed by God. He has the impress of deity on his brow. He was made exactly as God intended for him to be made. 
Now, it is a fact that though we were made perfect and upright and that uh, initially we had access to the tree of life, when we sinned, though, and our grandparents were driven from the Garden of Eden, mankind has become progressively weaker. And he has brought upon himself all sorts of attendant evils. Paul states it like this in Romans 5.12, By one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, so that death hath passed unto all men, for that all hath sinned. We're all reaping the consequences of what Adam and Eve did a long time ago. And so we are heir to all sorts of diseases. Now, it's not wrong for us to work for the betterment of human health. That doesn't go against the principle of the Bible. Jesus once made the statement, they that are in health have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. They that are sick do what, Lord? They that are sick need a doctor. Jesus put his stamp of approval on legitimate medicine and doctors. Luke, uh, the author of two New Testament books, was a doctor. Colossians 4.14, Luke, the beloved physician. So here's the point I want to make. It is not wrong to look for a cure to cancer. It is not wrong to try to find healing for diabetes or various other human ailments, either genetic or otherwise. But it does become wrong when scientists take it upon themselves to try to redesign the human being. Now, there is a line somewhere on that spectrum that is crossed over. I want to suggest this in passing. We have no idea what scientists may be able to theoretically or actually do in the next few years. Because men are able to do a lot of things that it's not right to do. There are certain biological laws that are operative no matter whether you subscribe to God's ethical system or not. For example, it was never the will of God that any child ever be conceived outside of wedlock with the exception of the virgin birth of Christ. God intended every child that ever come into the world to come into a home that has a mother and a father. And yet, clearly, people can engage in sexual intercourse outside of marriage, and when all the proper biological elements are there, a child will be conceived. It is contrary to to the ideal will of God, but it can happen anyway. I'm simply using that as an illustration. A lot of things may be done which very well may boggle our minds. But the fact that man is able to do it will not necessarily mean that it is the right thing to do. Now we're talking about the dignity of man and the ambition of some scientists to remake him. That brings me back to this idea of genetic engineering. In every human cell, there is a nucleus that contains genes, and along these genes are strands of DNA. That's an abbreviation for deoxyribonucleic acid. And it's what's called the biological stuff of life. Every single living organism has it. But the difference is it's coded differently. It's called the language of life because it is, in fact, a language. And I argue that it's one of the greatest existences of, or evidences for the existence of God that you can think of. There never has been a language that didn't have intelligence behind it. There is a biological language. There must have been some intelligence that originally wrote it. But the way the uh, chemicals are arranged determines whether or not a mouse or a worm or a man will be the final product. Now, scientists presently have the technology to go in there and to rearrange the information. 
so that they can redesign something. They say, well, it's going to be a great blessing. For example, this is probably the key to curing diabetes, sickle cell anemia, dwarfism, and other genetically related diseases. All right, granted, theoretically, that that would be a wonderful blessing to mankind. But what about the other side of the coin? When they decide, for example, as Hitler tried to do by the selective breeding process, that we want to develop a superhuman species of man. And we have the technology to do it. So we will simply redesign the human being. We're not trying to correct something that has gone awry. We're going to redesign him and according to our own wisdom pattern, make him better. I submit that the line has been crossed and the will of God has been violated. The basic biblical principle of the dignity of man who was fearfully and wonderfully made by God as an expression of His wisdom and not ours. I will not have time this evening to deal with the third principle that I wanted to mention, but you need to read it very carefully in the book. It's the principle of the recognition of the family arrangement as God originally designed it. God designed that every person, He desires that every person be a part of a home. And when we start suggesting that we will simply manufacture people out here that will be a part of no home, that will have no mother and father relationship. For example, a lesbian goes down and has herself uh, implanted, impregnated with somebody's egg and sperm. She brings a child to term and then she and her lesbian lover raise that child a clear violation of the Word of God in so many different particulars, not the least of which is that it frustrates God's marital plan and tries to circumvent it. And there are a lot of things that are going on in that general neighborhood that the principle of the human family, the divine family as designed by God, is in violation of. I wish you would think about these matters so very carefully. Do some reading. Do some research. These are issues that we're going to have to meet and deal with and be able to responsibly provide some good material to the generation coming onward. Thank you so very much for your courteous attention this evening.